Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Kelly Cleary, and I'm the Senior Director of Education and uh, Support Programs at FAIR, Food Allergy Research and Education. And now I would like to introduce today's presenter. Mary Vargas is a founding partner with the litigation firm Stein & Vargas, based in Washington, D.C., where she engages in nationwide impact litigation on behalf of individuals with disabilities. Mary has won key victories in federal courts throughout the United States on behalf of individuals with food allergies, celiac disease, and other disabilities. She was awarded the 2017 Fair Vision Award for Food Allergy Activism, the 2016 Eagle Award for Groundbreaking Disability Rights Litigation related to the representation of a deaf medical student, and the 2010 Advocacy for Persons with Pain Award. She is a 1998 Skaden Fellow and a 1994 Truman Scholar. Mary is the mother of three boys, one of whom has food allergies and celiac disease. And you know, we welcome Mary today. Mary has been a wonderful resource for lots of fair families. So Mary, I will hand it over to you, but thanks for being with us today. Great, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And for me, it is personal. I have been a disability rights attorney for about 26 years. Um, originally, I worked um, primarily on behalf of people who are deaf and hard of hearing until um, I opened my own practice. And right around that same time when I was doing um, disability discrimin discrimination litigation for my private firm, Stein and Vargas, this um, adorable kiddo changed my perspective. Um, he was, he's my youngest child. His name is Perry. And Perry was diagnosed with um, peanut allergies before the age of three. And since then, peanut, tree nut, shellfish, and celiac disease. And the way I got into doing this work is thanks to Perry. When he was five years old, um, he wanted to go to the same nature camp, day camp, that his brothers had gone to. It was a wonderful program they greatly enjoyed. I needed to be able to work um, and needed to have him safely occupied doing something worthwhile during the day. So when I signed Perry up for camp um, and I asked them the, the Friday afternoon before camp started, if I could drop off the EpiPen, um, that benefrin auto injector, uh, they said they would not hold it for him, but I could just, good news, I could just wait in the parking lot in the car all day long and hold his epinephrine in case he needed it. And in that one moment, my worlds collided because that was disability discrimination. That was the work I was already doing. And um, and now it was involving, it was involving my child. So Perry fits into all of these statistics, which may be familiar to many of you, the one in 13 kids in school who have food allergies, the 25% of kids who have their first reaction at school, although his first reaction wasn't technically at school, his first reaction was the result of um, peanut butter candy that his brother got at school and brought home in his backpack. And he is unfortunately also part of the one third of kids who report being bullied for their food allergies. So he is the reason I started doing this work. And most of my work and most of the rights that um, are available to students with food allergies fall under one of the four federal laws, Americans with Disabilities Act, which you've probably heard of, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and then these other two laws, the National School Lunch Act and the Child Nutrition Act, which I'm just gonna briefly mention. So these federal laws together provide students with disabilities the right to full and equal access. That may mean that they need modifications um, in the school day. It may mean that they need, need people willing to um, administer medications such as epinephrine or albuterol. Um, it means that they should have an equal right to participate, but also that they should be free from bullying based on their disabilities. And so all of these federal laws together sort of shape the landscape of the rights that our students with food allergies have. Now, most states also have a state um, disability discrimination law of some sort. There may be multiple state laws that impact um, students with food allergies. We're not gonna talk about those today. Many of those state laws 
let me just say they do many of them model um, the federal laws. And so the rights that we're going to be talking about are available to students in, in, in all 50 states, um, irrespective of what your specific state law may say, it could provide greater rights than, than what we're talking about today. So one of the, the most important things to wrestle with when we're talking about why students with food allergies qualify as individuals with disabilities is to understand that having a disability comes from a definition in federal law. It isn't a value judgment. It isn't a question of whether somebody is more or less disabled. It isn't a question of whether somebody has an a impairment that you can see. Um, Sometimes parents um, resist having their student with a food allergy, um, I'll use the word labeled, as, um, as a student with a disability. And it sometimes comes from a place, um, parents, parents love their kids, they mean well, they often, um, they don't want to overstep. And I've often heard that food allergy parents feel like maybe, um, maybe their student isn't as disabled as, or doesn't have as many rights as somebody who is deaf or blind or uses a wheelchair. And the reality is the question is an individual one. And does the individual student satisfy the definition of disability in federal law? And if they do, then they have rights, um, rights to non-discrimination. And it doesn't take away from the rights that um, a student, for example, who uses a wheelchair has. It doesn't make them um, more or less likely to be successful. It's simply a question of, does this student meet the definition of disability in federal law such that they have access to rights? The definition is what you see on your screen. It's um, loosely a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And as anyone who's got any experience with food allergy knows, eating, breathing, major life activities that are both impacted um, by food allergies. Now, federal law looks at what the impact is when the impairment is active. So the question isn't, you know, does my son, does, does his peanut allergy substantially impair him when he's not consuming peanuts? That's not the right question. The question is, is a person substantially limited when they consume their allergen, when their impairment is active? And there's a secondary definition that's equally important in the federal law, which is our major, major bodily um, systems impacted. And again, with food allergy, certainly during an anaphylactic reaction, multiple body systems such as a circulatory system, system, respiratory system can be impacted. So for all these reasons, um, somebody who has a food allergy very often will qualify as an individual with a disability. I sometimes, you know, I'm in a lot of the online Facebook groups for, for parents of kids with food allergies, and I often see um, people responding, well, food allergy is a hidden disability, so it's, it's you're automatically covered under um, the, the the federal law, the ADA or 504, and that's that's not really true. I mean, obviously, it is an individual, um, an, an invisible disability, but the way disability law is written is to not group people and make assumptions based on disability. Instead, for every disability, whether you are deaf or blind or use a wheelchair or have a food allergy or have celiac disease, the same um, definition has to be applied individually. Does this individual have a substantial impair uh, impairment that substantially limits a major life activity? And that question has to be asked of each individual. So it's not true to say that every person with a food allergy has a disability, just like it's not true to say every person who's blind has a disability. The way disability law is, you have to make um, that analysis based on the individual. And I've got this picture here of the doctors performing surgery. The, the man on the right is Zachary Featherstone. He is a deaf doctor we represented. Um, he's currently a pediatrician on the West Coast. Um, he is an individual with a disability 
in the same way that my child who has a food allergy is an individual with a disability. One is not more or less um, valid. One is not um, entitled to greater or lesser rights. It's an individual determination. So discrimination against students can look like a lot of different things. And my mental image of discrimination against students with food allergies always comes first to this picture. This picture is, um, it was taken at a, a public school in Pennsylvania. And if you look in the back, in the middle of the picture, you'll see um, a little desk, a solo desk. That desk was where a student with a food allergy, a kindergartner who was five years old, was expected to sit during lunch while his classmates sat at all of the circular tables um, in groups with friends. And for me, this is sort of the essence of, of why disability law matters, why it's important to know what rights our students have. Access to education does not just mean that you, you get the educational content in the classroom. It means that you're a full and equal participant. It means that you're valued and included to the same degree as other students. It means that you're kept safe. Part of safety is obviously that you're not ingesting your allergens at school, but another import, important part of safety that becomes increasingly important as kids get, get older is, is their mental health and is um, ensuring that they are valued as an equal part of the community. So discrimination at school may look like this, this isolation and separation of a student with a food allergy. It can look like um, denying participation in special activities, um, segregation, requiring somebody to eat lunch separately, not participate in special activities. It can be bullying, and um, that includes bullying of both students and parents. Sometimes we see that as um, the parents of students with food allergies face some pretty harsh um, conduct directed towards them, whether it's from teachers or from um, parents of other students. Disability law does not only protect individuals with disabilities, it also protects people who are associated with people with disabilities. So if a parent without a disability is subjected to um, discrimination because their child has a disability, is subjected to poor treatment because their child has a disability and they're advocating for their child, that could potentially violate federal law and that parent could have rights as well as the student. Discrimination also, of course, includes um, retaliation for, um, for asserting a person's disability-based needs. So before talking about the specific kinds of access that students with food allergies need in school, it's really important to set um, common expectations in terms of what the goal is. And the goal is always, in my mind, to develop a long-term, cooperative, respectful, and positive relationship with the school at all costs to the greatest extent possible. And I include the speed limit sign here for a very important reason. I know what it feels like when your child is excluded. I know what it feels like when, um, as a parent, we feel that our child is in danger. And um, there's a very mama bear and papa bear reaction that, that comes from that out of fear, um, out of seeing your own child at risk or hurt. And the reality is that every school will fall short at some point and in some way, just in the same way that all of us are going to go a little bit over the speed limit. The goal is not to give everybody a speeding ticket when they go 26 miles an hour. The goal is to really, for law enforcement, is to focus on when somebody's speeding in a really dangerous way when they're going, you know, 10 miles over the speed limit, when they're repetitively violating the law. Um, in the same way, the goal, a productive goal for, for students with food allergies cannot be a game of gotcha where schools make a mistake and every mistake, regardless of the magnitude, is treated um, with a um, severe reaction. Um, again, 
I understand what it feels like to drop your child off and recognize that they could have a serious or fatal reaction at school that day. I know what that feels like, but I also know that everybody makes mistakes, schools make mistakes, and developing a long-term positive relationship will allow you to interact from a place of respect in those moments where there are violations I don't advise people to rush to Department of Education and file an Office of Civil Rights complaint every time there's the slightest deviation from a 504 plan. Um, I, I don't advocate uh, burning things down every time there's a violation. We are all human, we all make mistakes. And to the greatest extent possible, I encourage parents to um, interact with respect in the same way that I would expect schools to interact with parents with respect. So with that said, recognizing there are going to be mistakes, um, there's lots of things to think about when assessing where accommodations need to be made for a student with food allergies. Typically, a student who qualifies as an individual with a disability because of their food allergy will have a 504 plan. And probably many of you have these kinds of plans for your children and are um, quite familiar with them. Some schools resist um, providing 504 plans for students with food allergies. I, I hear still that some schools try and, and say, well, there's no impact on, on learning, so we don't need a 504 plan. I would disagree with that. Um, some schools offer an IHP or an individual health plan and say, you know, this is really an issue that the nurse will manage. Um, it doesn't need a, a 504 plan. I would respectfully disagree with that as well. My, while it may be technically true that an IHP could address um, many of the needs for accommodation of a student with food allergy, they're really not well designed for that um, because food allergy impacts every aspect of the educational day. So, you know, maybe if we're only talking about a student needing to go to the nurse's office to get medication, maybe then um, an IHP makes sense. But what I know from my experience with my own child and from the clients I represent is that food allergy is pervasive throughout the school experience. It matters and requires accommodation in the classroom related to learning. It requires accommodations in the lunchroom in terms, to, in terms of safety and food on the playground in terms of access to medication and supervision to ensure there's not bullying. And it goes to after school programs and before school programs and clubs and special events. There's all kinds of things to think about. And what I encourage parents to do when they're first um, asserting rights to um, a 504 plan with their school is to request a meeting, to request a 504 plan, and to then look cooperatively with the school at every aspect of the school day and how to make sure that the student is safe and included in all those settings. So obviously the classroom is what most people think of and that's lessons, that's laboratories, it's projects, art projects, um, science experiments, um, the environment of the classroom, all of those things need to be thought about. And there should not be a time when a student with a food allergy is excluded from anything involving learning. And for example, even my, my student is now in high school. So things change as you get to you know 11th, 12th grade from what the accommodations are in kindergarten and first grade. But there are lots of um, lab experiments and, and the reality is that schools today have food throughout them in many different um, in many different forms, and something like you know science labs very frequently involves tasting things, involve manipulating foods, dividing foods. Math lessons can involve foods. Students with food allergies should not be excluded from those those learning experiences. And so it's important to proactively have a conversation as part of developing a 504 plan to make sure that it's not only that there's access to epinephrine um, ready in the classroom and somebody willing to administer, but that the learning environment is fully inclusive, that lab labs will be um, accessible, that they will be allowed to um, participate to the same degree safely that other students can. 
celebrations is a big touch point and you know third rail it's um it's an area where a lot of upset disagreement um allergic reactions um, risk and hurt feelings all come together some schools today have food celebrations it feels like every five minutes they have um, birthdays and um special events and special ice cream days. Um, some schools, I would say, have looked a little bit harder globally at inclusion and have recognized that the pervasive food cult culture in schools is um, problematic for lots of kids and for lots of reasons. So some schools don't allow food to be brought in. Some schools only permit food to be provided by the school dining service provider. There's sort of a range of, of um, what the culture is around food in a school. This is an area where there tends to be um, very strong reactions from sometimes from teachers, sometimes from parents of other students. Um, it tends to be that the, the children are um, accustomed to being inclusive and very often it's the adults who struggle more to be inclusive and think about celebrations. So there's lots of ways to navigate these celebrations um, through a 504 plan, but I think the most important thing is to have a proactive and open discussion ahead of time so that everybody can agree to what is going to be done in the moment when there's a celebration, whether that's you know a special treat box that is sent from home, whether there's no food celebration, some schools are doing, you know books are being um, shared on birthdays or stickers are shared on birthdays, whatever it is, if there's a common understanding, if there's open dialogue about that in advance, it's more likely to be um, well received by everyone. And also if there are con consistent expectations um, for all parents. One thing I would caution against, I know sometimes when parents are coming in with a, a kindergartner who's in school for the first time with a food allergy, which I know is terrifying. And there sometimes is um, the idea to communicate, have the school send out communication to other parents about um, not bringing in certain foods for lunch or snacks or um, about a student's food allergy. I would be very cautious in those communications because again, they're sort of touchstones for anger and disagreement and loss of privacy. Um, I've seen sometimes where schools may be meeting well, send out communications saying, you know, Jane Smith has a food allergy, so we can't do birthday celebrations. Those kind of communications are very, very damaging. They lead to bullying by other parents, by other students. And so I would just be really cautious in thinking about how such communications go out and making sure that they don't single out your student in a way that subjects them to um, physical or emotional risk. There needs to be access to medication across all learning environments, so whether it's the classroom, the lunchroom, the playground. Um, sometimes we see schools are um, more comfortable having epinephrine only in nurses' offices I push back on that very, very hard. Some, some school campuses are large. Um, sometimes there are substitute teachers. Sometimes students are on the playground or moving from place to place. Sometimes a school nurse isn't always available and the, and the, the nursing or the health room is locked. I personally am an advocate for, um, to the greatest extent possible, having epinephrine immediately available where the student is and to the greatest extent um, possible for the student that they self-carry. And to be clear, self-carry does not mean an expectation that they administer their own medication. It means that the medication is with them where they are, that they're able to safely carry it, um, and, and that it's always available, whether they're with an aide on the playground after lunch having an allergic reaction or on a field trip, or um, you know, in a music class, that it's always right where the student is and there's no delay in trying to access that medication um, when the worst happens. In the lunchroom, again, people have different feelings about what's best for their student. There's different um, medical needs for students depending on their diagnosis, depending on potentially other disabilities they may have. 
Some people prefer that their students sit at um, a top eight free table. Some parents prefer that their students have a zone of safety where the student to the left and right of them and maybe across from them doesn't have their allergens. Um, some parents prefer that their students eat at the regular table, um, just like all the other students. It really depends on the student's needs. It depends on the school's culture. It depends on their, the medical recommendations of their, their specialists. And so there's sort of a range of things that could suit individual needs and a one size fits all decision is almost always not going to be the right one. Disability law, again, by definition, is an individual, um, an individual matter where you look at the individual needs of students. On the playground, there are two things I want to say about that. It's a very, um, it's an area where students are at risk for allergic reactions because they've just eaten lunch, because they're running around, because they may still have food with them. And because it's also an area where there tends to be less supervision, more chaos, more running around. Um, so it's particularly important in thinking about a 504 plan for your student to make sure that they have ready access to medication on the playground and that the people who are responsible for them are ready, willing, and able to administer. They're trained to do so. And that they're also trained to be looking out for the students socially and emotionally to make sure that there's not bullying happen happening related to disability or anything else on the playground. Other places where students have rights outside of the classroom, outside of the lunchroom and the playground, before and after school activities. Um, lots of schools operate their own before and after school programs. Those kinds of programs cannot discriminate based on disability. The same federal laws would apply to them. Um, some of those before and after school programs are run at the schools by outside entities. So they may be run by um, a, a private nonprofit organization. They may be run by um, bias. I've seen some rec departments run aftercare or before care programs. These programs are particularly important for parents, whether their students have food allergies or not. Whether it's publicly run or privately run, it cannot be offered in a way that excludes students with food allergies. The federal laws would apply equally to either a public or private provider. And it's not just a matter of the students must be included, they must have access to epinephrine. Sometimes we've seen that in before and after care programs, you know, at 3.30, the school, the nurse's office gets locked down. And, um, you know, if a, care, a student isn't self-carrying, if the program doesn't have um, epinephrine auto injectors on hand after the nurse's office gets locked, that's a real, really dangerous, uh, potentially dangerous situation. So it's important to make sure, again, not only that students have an opportunity to participate, but that they have access to medication and adults who are trained to recognize allergic reactions and able to administer. So that could be part of your 504 planning with a school if it's a program operated by the school. If it's operated by a private provider, you may have to advocate for your student directly with that provider. But I would say, my brother is an assistant superintendent of school, so he's always telling his, I think his employees, you got to do that or my sister's going to sue you. And there, there is truth in terms of private providers who operate in schools. They, they cannot discriminate. If they do, not only is the private provider potentially, um, potentially open to liability, but schools that allows those programs to operate inside their buildings, on their playgrounds, with their facilities, and they allow them to operate in a way that's discriminatory, those schools also face their own liability. You cannot have schools operating in a way that excludes students or subjects them to danger before or after school or during the school day. Big part of planning for 504 plans, particularly in K through six, K through eight, is thinking about field trips, whether parents will be allowed the option to attend field trips. Um, there obviously needs to be access to epinephrine. There needs to be an adult who's trained and able to administer. You need to think through um, whether field trips are 
are designed in ways that are inclusive. It might be a good conversation to have at the beginning of the year. If you have a student with a wheat allergy, for example, if that grade goes and visits a pizzeria where flour is being tossed in the air and is excessively airborne, that's not an inclusive field trip. And it would be great to talk at the beginning of the year in a general sense about making sure that any field trips that are planned are field trips that are inclusive for everybody. Um, you know, if you're going to a bakery and, and decorating cookies, is that going to be safe for a student with um, celiac disease, for a student with a wheat allergy, um, for a student with, you know, really any, any allergy could be impacted by that kind of field trip. I still hear all too often about parents um, being forced to come and pick their students up because they are not going to be allowed to participate in field certain field trips or parents having to keep their students home from school on field trip days because field trips are not safe and accessible. That shouldn't happen. Again, federal law covers everything to do with um, with public schooling and most private schooling. It needs to be um, there needs to be equal opportunity and equal and safe access. And there should be no circumstance where parents um, are forced or feel like they're being forced to, to keep their child home because their child wouldn't be safe or wouldn't be included in a school-related activity. Schools also have obligations to be accessible for special events. My child's school every year would have an international day, which um, was very much beloved by lots of students and parents, but was a really hard day for students with food allergies. You know, parents will bring in um, traditional foods from their countries of origin for people to sample. And that's not something um, that a student with a food allergy can typ typically safely participate in. So again, if you can proactively have conversations when you're developing a relationship, when you're setting up a 504 plan with the school about what kinds of special events are there during the year? And can we talk about in advance, before they're planned, before the information goes out to the rest of the school community, are those activities inclusive? Can they be revised in a way that they're inclusive for everybody, safe for everybody? Um, and how specifically is your student going to be able to participate safely in those events? The other thing that's really important to think about is emergency planning. Unfortunately, there are reasons of all kinds these days why, while, why students are held after school, sometimes for many hours. When there are weather events, we just recently had a micro storm um, in my little town, which caused students to be held at school. Um, there may be a time where your student is held at school and the school is providing snacks or foods to other students. And it is important to think through um, what food is going to be available to your child in those moments. It's a little bit like the special events, but it, it, may, be, um, it may be something that's more serious and require more thought. And, and what a lot of parents do, it's what I did um, with my son, is every year I would provide what's called an, an oops lunch. I've heard other names for it. But it's a shelf-stable, extra, complete meal with snacks that's safe for the student that's kept you know, in the classroom or in the nurse's office or somewhere at school so that in the event of an emergency that keeps a student longer at school, beyond the school day, they will have safe food. When there's a weather emergency, that's the last moment you want there to be um, a student having um, a medical emergency. And you know that kind of planning also helps on the day when your student forgets their lunch if they're a student who brings lunch to school. And so, you know, then there's a lunch that's safe for everybody. My student forgot his lunch a few times and it was always on the day when I had a conference or was in court. And um, it was nice to have that food, the safe food that I knew was there for him to access. So I would think about that kind of emergency planning as well. The more you can think about access ahead of time, I think the less stressful it is for everybody, the more um, cooperative and respectful the relationship will be. And while you very likely know your students' needs and your students' food allergies uh, better than anyone, the school officials, the teachers, they know what the school day looks like. And I would invite you not only to go in and say, 
these are the things I'm concerned about. These are the things that I think need to be included in a 504 plan for my student. I would encourage you to ask the professionals at the school, the teachers, the administrators, what are you concerned about? Is there anything you can think of that my student might need um, accommodations for that I might not be aware of? And the example that I give, um, when I went in with, with my own kindergartner before he started school, and I, I had things in mind that I knew my student would need, but I said to, this to the principal, what, what worries you? What where do you think there might be um, there might be concerns? And he thought of something I never in a million years would have thought of, even having had two older non-allergic kids at that school. And what he said is, I'm actually really worried about when in the school day your son has physical education. Because on rainy days, physical education happens in the lunchroom. And if your student has physical education, after lunch and he's down on the floor stretching or rolling around or playing games, he could be having his hands in his allergens and then potentially touching his face or his eyes or his mouth. I never would have thought of this. It was the principal's idea. He recognized the importance of it. And he said, I'm going to make sure that your son, his, his entire class always has physical education in the morning, just in case. And I appreciated that. And I think he appreciated me not only expressing my child's needs, but respecting the fact that he had valuable contributions as well. So there are a lot of issues we've, we've talked about in terms of access in the classroom, outside of the classroom. We've talked a little bit about um, bullying issues, both of students and parents. This can, one of the other places this can happen is around um, PTA or parent teacher association type groups, um, events that are sponsored at the school for the school community by um, outside organizations. Those should be inclusive to the extent students are allowed to participate, everybody should be allowed to participate. But sometimes those are challenging areas for conversations because they involve other parents who are um, potentially running organizations who may not be aware um, of the legal rights that are being implicated. One other thing that's worth mentioning, high stakes testing like SAT and ACT testing you are allowed to bring your epinephrine auto injector into that kind of high stakes testing. You don't need advance approval. Um, and so, you know, your student may have other accommodations that they need from college board, for example, extended time, if they have learning disabilities or ADHD, those need to be um, discussed in advance. They need to be approved by college board, but currently, um, epinephrine auto injectors do not need to be approved in advance. They can and should be brought into the testing room. Um, frequently, 11th and 12th graders who are taking the SATs come with granola bars, which often have a lot of allergens just naturally in them. Um, it's an anxious day, and it's important for your student to be safe while they're participating um, in, in that important testing. Beyond um, the school day, there's all kinds of other rights that students with food allergies have in other environments. For example, camps and clubs almost universally would be subject to the same federal laws that we've talked about in school. And so, for example, camps would not be able to exclude a student because of their um, food allergy. And on the right of your screen, you'll see um, it's probably hard for you to read, but it's a letter of finding from the United States Department of Justice um, in a case that uh, a claim that was filed against um, an after school type program. It was not held at a school. It was held at a theater. Um, it was the kind of program where you could sign up your student and pay a fee for, for your child to perform Shakespeare. Um, client that I represented was um, denied participation in this program. And um, the US Department of Justice said that that was discrimination. There has also been litigation of this type against camps involving clubs and private entities that have excluded um, kids with food allergies and adults with food allergies. That kind of behavior is um, discriminatory and um, typically would violate federal law. 
Students also have rights as individuals with disabilities when they get jobs after school and as they go into the workforce. Um, there's, a, uh, there's This is a whole separate topic, but it is important to have a conversation with your students who may be um, looking at applying for their first jobs to talk with them about when it is and isn't appropriate and in their best interests to identify as an individual with a disability and to request accommodations. While there are exceptions to the rule, it is generally my opinion that individuals should not disclose disability until after an offer of employment is made. Um, and then it should be disclosed if they require accommodations from their employer. Getting a lot of questions this time of year about students in college. All of these same rights apply in both public and private colleges. One word of caution, when you've advocated for 504 plans for your student K through 12 and suddenly they're going to college, the language does change a little bit. Although the same law applies, although section 504 would, would ensure that your student has rights in college to make sure they have full and safe access to dining services, or if dining services is not accessible because of the nature of their disability, that they are able to opt out of the dining plan um, and have access to a kitchen, that they have the appropriate dormitory housing to meet their, their disability-based needs. Um, all of those rights apply, but there is not a 504 plan, so to speak. That language isn't typically used in college. So when we're talking about college, it's more a matter of a student, strongly preferred that it's student-led, that a student goes to um, the University Disability Services Office, it has some name usually like Office of Disability Services, identifies what their disability is, usually will have to provide some kind of documentation from their specialist saying that they have a disability and what their needs are for accommodations. And then, um, the student will dialogue with this office to determine what kind of um, what kind of needs there are and what kind of accommodations will, will be made. It's just not referred to as a 504 plan. And if you use that language in the college setting, um, you won't get a great response. Um, it's a really important time going into college to make sure that you're transitioning, and the transition I would say starts way before that, that students start transitioning to take the lead and advocating for themselves. High school is definitely a time when they should have the opportunity to practice that by participating in their 504 planning, because when they go to college, they will bear the ultimate burden and responsibility for advocating for themselves with um, with the universities. It can be very challenging when a student is away from home for the first time, when they may be scared, when they may not have access to safe food, for them suddenly to be have to become have to become their own self-advocate. And so to the extent that during their K through 12 education, as they gain the maturity, that they are um, empowered to advocate for themselves in an age appropriate way as part of the 504 plot process so that they're ready to do it um, when the time comes. Now, I wanted to leave time for questions. It looks like we do have a lot of questions. So um, I'm happy to answer general questions. I've also included my email here. Um, email is generally the best way to reach me. I'm very happy to um, communicate with individuals with food allergies, with parents of kids with food allergies. Um, I am being a little bit slammed right now because of the time of year that it is. Um, so, you know, I'll respond as, as, as quickly as I'm able. Thank you, Mary. That was fantastic. And I have to tell you, the Q&A was on fire. So lots of questions. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to try to sum up a couple of the big ones that were really recurrent, recurring themes that we saw. So I think you spoke a lot about 504 plans, which gave us a lot of information. There were questions on can a 504 plan be uh, denied? And if a school is pushing back on giving a student a 504, what are the next steps for the family? So... If a student is not an individual with a disability, a 504 plan can be denied. 
I would suspect that most of the people participating in this webinar today have students who would qualify for a 504 plan. I think it would be, I've, I've not ever seen a student with a food allergy who has not um, been appropriately, sh should not have received a 504 plan. Schools do push back. The things I hear, um, Sometimes I hear, you know, you, you could have an IHP instead. I, I really don't like that. Um, while it may technically be acceptable, um, I would push for a 504 plan. And I think the law would, in most cases, support that. 504 plan is enforceable in a way that an IHP might not be. Um, I also hear sometimes schools say, we have these great global policies that we make sure, you know, there's, for example, there's no peanuts um, allowed in lunches. There's no peanut butter allowed in lunches. So your student with a peanut allergy doesn't need any individual accommodations. I would say that's almost never true for all the reasons we've talked about already. And that a school that's saying that is not thinking about all the ways an individual child is interacting with the school system. There's no global plan that's gonna cover every student's need and, and a global um, strong allergy policies does not take away your federal rights to have a 504 plan and to have access to a fair and appropriate education. A lot of times, um, I would say almost all the time, you can push back calmly and respectfully with good information and the school will um, hopefully educate itself and, and no formal action is required. I mean, you can proceed to things like due process. That is not the way to start off a relationship with a school that you could be interacting with for eight or 12 years um, or even longer if you have multiple students. To the greatest extent possible, you want to try and preserve and build a strong relationship. And so to the extent you can provide education, um, to provide information. FAIR has materials. You can reach out to someone like me. You can find materials online about um, 504 plans and food allergy and um, national guidelines on, on what rights what rights there are. To the extent you can um, respectfully educate your school, in my experience, they they really do always then ultimately agree to a 504 plan. Yeah, I think that's so important. And I know you and I have discussed that, you know, separately from this webinar, that it is really important for families to recognize that this is an ongoing relationship with that school and could be eight to 12 years. So I love the idea of infusing education for the school and families within the school um, with that. Um, we got a lot of questions about, I know you touched on, um, you know, private schools and, you know, laws that can help within private schools. But can you just, is there a differentiation between the ADA and application in private schools versus public schools? Yes. So private schools, as a general rule, also have to be um, accessible and cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. There are a few exceptions to that. So there's, um, there's a question, the part of the ADA that applies to private schools is Title III. Title III doesn't allow for financial damages, so there may be a, an issue there in terms of where there's a very serious you know, pattern of violations. Um, you may be able to ultimately change policies in court, but you may not be entitled to money where there's been um, discrimination. Most parents, that's really not what they're thinking about in terms of access. Most parents are thinking about, will there be accommodations made for my students' disabilities? And the one thing that comes up is when we're looking at um, religious private schools. There may be times where religious schools aren't covered by Title III. It depends um, on the individual facts and circumstances of the school. Um, but often, even if the ADA doesn't apply to a religious school, we often see that religious schools are more likely to receive, receive federal financial assistance than non-religious schools. For example, a lot of Catholic schools um, in Maryland, at least where I'm based, receive um, milk and other kinds of food products from the federal government. Any entity that accepts federal financial assistance, so either federal dollars 
or federal benefits like um, here's milk for your students, here are reduced price lunches for your students, is obligated to comply with Section 504 and cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. So in most cases, um, private schools can't discriminate. It, when we're talking beyond K through 12, um, college and universities, almost universally accept federal financial assistance in the form of student federal student aid. Um, so that's really not an issue for um, for colleges and universities. And most of the time it turns out not to be an issue for um, K through 12. If you wanna know if your private school receives federal financial assistance, there is a website where you can check that. It's www.usaspending.gov. I would say that this website is not as user-friendly as it used to be. And um, if you find federal, <laughs> financial assistance when you do a search, it is very reliable. If you can't find federal financial assistance when you do a search, keep searching. Um, I don't always rely on, uh, on that website as being determinative that there is not federal financial assistance. It often comes through other entities, counties and local governments um, and private contractors. So um, it takes a more nuanced search and some experience really searching to figure it out. You may see that private schools also don't use the language of 504 plans. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a kindergartner at a private school was told you don't get a 504 plan just because the school doesn't use that language. They would still need to be provided full and equal access and there should be a written um, a written plan, which the school may not want to call a 504 plan, but there should be a written plan for ensuring full, equal, and safe access. So I wouldn't get too hung up on the, that language, either in college or universities or in private schools, whereas in public schools, K through 12, the 504 plan language does matter. No, that was great. Um, and I think in, in line with talking about the you know schools receiving federal funds i think that there were a lot of questions in the chat that were talking about you know replacements for equivalent meals if kids um, are entitled to that and what is your thought on what amount of variety um, should sort of be guaranteed i think that that's been a hot topic of like hearing that in that equivalent meal a child is getting the same meal 5 days a week so what is your, what are your thoughts <laughs> This is the really hot topic and I kind of love it because to me it's it says we're getting past can they be in the room to is their experience equal. So I feel like the fact that this conversation is happening so much means that we've made a lot of progress. Are we there yet? No. So I mentioned the National School Lunch Act. Um, there, there are federal laws that require if meals are provided to students that um, that all students have um, nutritionally equivalent and um, functionally equivalent access to food. I know in many states, particularly post-COVID, breakfast is being provided. For example, in Massachusetts, I think all students are now provided with breakfast and lunch. So that means that if a parent wants their child to have access to safe food at school, that the school would be obligated to provide that. There is debate, of course, about what that means, and it's going to depend on the individual circumstances for each child. There's no one answer to that. I would say that functionally equivalent would mean that it doesn't contain their allergens, that it's safe for them, that it's nutritional um, in the same way that a meal would be nutritional for a student without a medically necessary um, diet like a, a, a diet for someone with a food allergy. But I would also say, and this is where there's not clear law to back me up. This is more my gut as 26 years of doing this. I think functionally equivalent means if you're giving the student with food allergy, um, what have I seen? Chips with cheese sauce every day. And you're giving the students without an allergy, different meal options every day of the year. I don't think at some point 
we cross the line and it's no longer functionally equivalent. And there has to be discussion about what that point is. You know, a student who's getting, um, you know, we see sometimes a student with celiac disease, for example, or a wheat allergy is um, given the same one cereal every day for breakfast. I would say that 180 days of rice checks is not full and equal access and is not nutritionally equivalent to the students who are getting waffles one day and eggs and bacon one day and Lucky Charms one day. Um, there is some tipping point where there needs to be variety and it also needs to be um, not only safe, but um, but balanced. And I'm seeing some really weird meals that are being served to students with food allergies and celiac disease that make no sense, that nobody would want and not nutritional and that are um, that are only safe. And I think the law requires more than just safe, but it's not entirely clear yet where that line is. There hasn't really been litigation because it's really a post COVID phenomena to be talking about this in public schools. Now, the answer is a little more clear in terms of private schools. There are private schools, particularly some of the really um, expensive private prep schools that provide quite extraordinary meals, um, beautiful meals for their students. Parents are paying for these meals. And I think legally, the legal obligations are, are more clear, more clear cut in those settings. You can't have a situation where students are getting beautiful restaurant restaurant quality safe meals and the student with the food allergy is getting nothing and they're paying the same price. There shouldn't be a situation where the student is getting um, a ham sandwich every day while everybody else is getting a hot meal and everyone's paying the same price. I think those legal questions are a little, it's a little easier to draw the line in those settings than it is in public schools right now. And I'm going to ask one last question because it really came up a lot in the Q&A. So if anyone has to drop off, because I know we're at almost two o'clock, thank you for coming. Please take the survey. But the last question had to do with epi um, access. And, you know, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of people asking about, are teachers able to say, I don't want to be trained? Or is there, what's the pushback for parents if there there is pushback on them that they don't want to train staff and teachers on epinephrine use or talk about epinephrine storage. So I've I've heard this a lot. I don't know that I've ever seen any document that actually would prevent um, a teacher from learning or administering epinephrine. Um, I hear sometimes that there, you know, there's a union contract that would give a teacher rights not to do, you know, not to not to provide that kind of access. I don't know that I've ever actually seen an agreement that says that. I think this is it's sort of a mythical creature, like it's a unicorn, like it's out there in theory. Um, if it came to the point of litigation, I'm not sure that it, that claim would stand up. Regardless, I think the ultimate issue is, does the student have access without delay to an adult who is trained and willing to administer epinephrine. And, you know, there are some states where students with food allergies, New York, for example, I'm hearing a lot of students with food allergies have AIDS. Um, so, you know, if, if the teacher doesn't want to administer and the school is going to permit the teacher to opt out, then there needs to be another adult that's there. Um, willing and able to administer. This is not a burden on a student. This is not, the student doesn't have to risk themselves in order to access their education. This is a problem that the school has an obligation to solve. And whether it's the teacher or whether it's an aide or whether it's some adult in the classroom, it's somebody who's immediately available. The idea on these huge school campuses with increasingly few nurses that are often shared between multiple, um, multiple schools in one district, I get really concerned when there's not somebody in the classroom who's ready and willing to administer. We should not be relying on nurses in their offices to be available. The delay of a few minutes could mean 
your child's life. And, um, and there needs to be planning for that. And to the extent teachers may have this mythical, this mythical ability to um, decline, that is an issue that the school needs to solve. That is not a burden that would then be placed on the student to be at greater risk or not have um, an adult right there, uh, ready, willing, and able to administer. Thank you so much, Mary. I know we went a couple of minutes over, but this was you know, the information was just so valuable for all of us. I know as a food allergy mom, um, I can't wait to have you back. Um, but, you know, there are just so many questions and we all just want to protect. If we're working in schools, we want to protect our students. If we're caregivers, we want to protect our kids. So thank you for all that you are doing. And thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. I, I think it was really, it, it went a long way because I, I learned a lot myself and I can't wait to, to see what you have to say next time you join us. So thank you for, for coming today. Thank you so much.